Racecraft by Barbara J. Fields and Karen Fields, Chapter 7, Witchcraft and Racecraft, Invisible Ontology in its Sensible Manifestations. The right-minded teaching that race has nothing to do with biology but is merely a social construction is true but misleading. For one thing, there is nothing mere about a social con construct. From the days of Thomas Jefferson, what Americans believe in as biological race has always been, at the same time, embodied and disembodied, visible and invisible. For another, discovering the independence from biology of what Americans call race opens the way to investigating social construction itself, as thought and as action. By identifying the properties of which beliefs, the great anthropologist E. E. Evans Pritchard set theoretical questions about rationality that busied British philosophers for a generation. Inspired by his work and the extended debate it catalyzed, this chapter explores rationale and rationality in American race beliefs. By 1959, I could see that the visible and invisible differences between living races could be explained only in terms of history. Um, that one sentence was a quotation from Carlton S. Kuhn um, from a book called The Origins of Races. I propose to consider together topics that are usually considered separately. My research has pressed me to explore both witchcraft with the invisible ontology it presupposes and what I will call racecraft with the invisible ontology that it too presupposes but I have attended to them one after the other in the African and the Afro-American sides of my work. Moreover, while attending to them separately, I have weighed them differently. Following the well-established practice of most Africanists in this country, I have been granting the rationality of witchcraft, but not that of racecraft. That practice now seems to me troublesome, logically and ethically. If we judge by the dependence of both on presuppositions that are demonstrably false, according to modern science, then both sets of traditional beliefs should go down together as irrational. But if we discount their falsity by that standard, then they should rise together as rational. Under our usual practice, they do neither. It is as though they were as different as cabbages and kings, a mistake, it seems to me. Still, I will not argue that they are both cabbages or both kings, but that study of their traits in common can increase the power of the intellectual tools with which we try to understand both. By now, E. E. Evans Pritchard's path-breaking study, Witchcraft, Oracles, and Magic Among the Azande, has shown over two, genera two generations of researchers how Africa's traditional beliefs about an invisible ontology of spirits can be rationally held even if false, and even if held onto in the presence of counter countervailing evidence. On the one hand, by accepting his analysis, we have come to regard the falsity of those beliefs as their most apparent yet least important trait. On the other hand, our equally well-established practice in regard to race beliefs accents the falsity of those beliefs in a quite un-Pritchardian -Pritchard way. Thus, although traditional race beliefs, like traditional spirit beliefs, have resisted the better part of a century's worth of disconfirming scientific demonstrations, we do not give them their own Pritchardian hoist into the realm of rationality. We approach witchcraft and racecraft as if they belonged to two different orders of phenomena, as if one were compelling belief and the other a bad choice in matters of belief. One, truth of a different order, and the other, false beliefs destructible through the propag propagation of truth. One, an element of human diversity, and the other, an ugly reaction to that diversity. This disjunction in our practice is of long standing. I have begun to suspect a short circuit deep in the intellectual apparatus that Evans Pritchard bequeathed to us. I propose, therefore, to query this different treatment and to locate the short circuit. My suggestion is that witchcraft and racecraft are so like one another that, by not comparing them, we conceptualize neither as sharply as we might and, besides, stumble continually into paradox. 
Here then are some not yet fully linked or elaborated thoughts that arise from my current ethnographic work in progress about racecraft in an American community. The new work is informed by my past analyses of witchcraft in several African communities. As a first step, let me make three disclosures that will situate and perhaps clarify what I have to say. The half-light of Evans Pritchard's legacy, rationality of witchcraft, a rationality of racecraft. First, my reading of In My Father's House by the Ghanaian philosopher K. Anthony Apaya throws the logical and ethical conundrums just indicated into sharp relief. In the chapter titled Old Gods, New Worlds, Apaya defends the rationality of spirit beliefs by applying and imaginatively extending the interpretive strategies that Evans Pritchard pioneered. But in a separate chapter on race beliefs, he applies different strategies that, relying on modern science, cannot serve such a defense. The inevitable results are disclosed by the chapter's title, Illusions of Race. There, Apaya logically but paradoxically concludes that, owing to his failure to transcend those illusions, the great anti-racist W.E.B. Dubois was both a lifelong opponent of racism and a lifelong racist. The subject throughout is Dubois' tragic admirement in false irrational belief and consequent moral error. Meanwhile, at the other end of the book, Apaya's discussion of the invisible ontology of spirits climbs after Robin Horton from ethnography into philosophy of science and suspension of moral judgment. Observ observation from that vantage point reveals African theoretical thought to be not unlike its European scientific cousin, underdetermined by observation. A thought-provoking mouthful that, so let us stop and think. What sort of intellectual strategy is it that permits us both to dismiss race beliefs as illusions and at the same time to insulate spirit beliefs from the same dismissal? Without our professional habit of thinking about them separately, even as in this case between the covers of a single book, Africanists would assign both the fate of the outlaws in the German proverb, caught together, hung together. Rationality of racecraft, a rationality of witchcraft. Evans, Evans Pritchard's classic implicitly assigned them separate fates. After all, his work disputed a postulate of racecraft, namely the inferior intellect of African primitives as allegedly proved by their holding on to traditional spirit beliefs in the teeth of countervailing evidence. Evans Pritchard was writing at a time when the old argument from craniology had imploded, but hydra-like were rapidly being replaced. In other words, a racecraft demonstrably able to resist evidence against it stood at his very elbow as he devised still more evidence against it, but evidence of precisely the kind that, by his own demonstration, would not have prevailed against Zandi beliefs and mental habits. Therefore, deployed against the postulate of Africans' intellectual difference, his demonstration implied a commitment to one or both forms of the following assumption. Either his European readers were in fact intellectually unlike his African subjects, or Africa's witchcraft and Europe's racecraft were different orders of phenomena, which, both being artifacts of the mind, boils down to the same thing. Either form imperils the position from which he began, that humankind is intellectually one. Witchcraft, Oracles, and Magic is a powerful book of interpretation, but it is not a work of recognition. In it, a gifted observer hands his readers keys to something remote and strange, but stops at an unequivocal, paradoxical, and ultimately illogical halfway house on the way to human oneness. As a work of interpretation only, the book could not go further, but it was also a practical work, and in some sense did not need to. In his preface, Evans Pritchard addressed the book to colonial administrators, missionaries, and medical professionals. Europeans at work among the Azande, yet as far from the Azande as Europe's secular scientific rationality placed them. 
So Evans Pritchard's comparing that secular scientific mode to the Zandi mode was an amazing tour de force, but at the end of the day, it nonetheless provided equivocal, paradoxical, and illogical evidence about the intellectual oneness of humankind. My dissatisfaction with it brings me to my second observation. Meanwhile, beliefs and habits that are Zandi-like, so to speak, thrived close to Evans Pritchard's home and they still do, close to our own. He had Europe's secular scientific rationality in mind, not the differently constituted common sense rationality of everyday life. But modern science did not and could not extinguish its longer established and more prolific relative with both energizes, which both energizes and bedevils science itself. Shared irrational features of witchcraft and racecraft. In my work on racecraft, I have been struck over and over again by such intellectual commonalities with witchcraft as circular reasoning, prevalence of confirming rituals, barriers to disconfirming factual evidence, self-fulfilling prophecies, multiple and inconsistent causal ideas, and colorfully inventive folk genetics. And to these must be added varieties of more or less legitimized collective action such as gossip, exclusion, scapegoating, and so on, up to and including various forms of coercion, which is to say that the logical and methodological byways of racecraft, like those of witchcraft, are rife with dangers to body as well as to mind. Taken together, such traits constitute a social world whose inhabitants experience and act on a marrow deep certainty that racial differences are real and consequential, whether scientifically demonstrable or not. Obviousness is the hallmark of such a world. The evidence is everywhere, populating the banalities and the show stoppers of life. So the results of telling any inhabitant of such a world that races do not exist are like those I used to read from colonial district commissioners' reports of informing villagers that witches do not exist. Those results amount to a what's up with you incredi incredulity. What is more, there seems to be little difference between the mental makeshifts of the, of the proverbial person in the street and the accentuated rationality of academic life. I regularly get what's up with you reactions in college classes, and I once got them at a panel on race by University of Rochester biologists, whose professional engagement with modern population genetics did not, in their view, undermine the folk classification. The question that issued from my almost solitary black face, why not, earned me the kind of withering certitude that is but a step removed from anger. I take it as characteristic that the rational software of racecraft, like that of witchcraft, accommodates disconfirming evidence in additive rather than transformative fashion. Shared rational features of witchcraft and racecraft. I did not say the irrational software of either, and that brings me to my third disclosure. Since the irrationality of racecraft is part and parcel of our ethical stand against it, my setting that irrationality aside, even for the sake of argument, may seem perverse. But in my work of retranslating Emil Durkheim's masterpiece, The Elementary Forms of Religious Life, I came to a realization that sobered me. If he is right, the roots of racecraft are not unreason but its dignified human opposite, reason. One of Durkheim's core arguments is that reason is born in social life, but that society can exist only by being collectively imagined. That is, by constituting a real world that acquires its reality by transcending fact as available to the senses operating on their own. That aspect of reason cannot possibly be secular, open to choice, or provisional, temporary and open to disconfirming evidence. In one among many harrowing examples, Durkham tells us the response of an Australian member of the kangaroo clan to being shown a, pho a photograph of himself. The kangaroo points to the photo and affirms to the ethnographers that he and the kangaroo are the same. He could not have been telling the truth unless the invisible ontology of totemic essences, not to mention the folk genetics, made it so. But, and here's the thing, neither could he have been truthfully stating that, it, that, 
never could he have been truthfully stating his matrilineal descent, which he shared with others of the kangaroo clan. The study of totemic clans interested Durkham because, as he says on the first page, it would yield a fundamental and permanent aspect of humanity. Unlike witchcraft, oracles, and magic, the arguments of forms was not a they argument with in, inter, interpretational keys to open doors abroad, but not those at home. Durkham's Legacy Our grasp of the sobering intensity of this argument tightens when we recall that Durkham was working toward forms in the midst of European imaginings about rational identity. It was a time when imagining Frenchness kept throwing off volatile rituals of intra-European racecraft, incandescent ones in the street demonstrations of the anti dreyfusards And so it was also a time for imagining rebarbative ritual antidotes. For example, Rabbi Armand Bloch sought to imagine a French nationality with Jews rather than without by showing his congregation how a statue of Jean uh, Jeanne d'Arc could be suffered in their sanctuary. Was she not in a sense like Queen Esther? It is as a witness to this hot button blood politics, though also as an accused, that Durkheim studied the phenomena through the ethnographer's strategy of remote imagining. He found that this collective imagining, at home or elsewhere, this adding to whatever could possibly be real in the physical sense, is at the fount of reason, not its opposite. Such figments are reason's raw material. To borrow now from a paya, they contain theories that contribute to forming our experience and give meaning to the language we use for reporting it. If figments have that function, they come to us and must come to us as certainties ubiquitously evidenced. Doubt is not obviously sensible, but neither on Durkheim's showing is reason itself. Invisibility and in reason. To claim there is heuristic value in examining witchcraft and racecraft together is not to claim that they are alike in all respects, or despite their ge geographical separation, are one and the same thing. Nor, on the other hand, is it to claim that the trait I think they share, presupposing an invisible ontology, is the sole basis for comparison. In point of fact, by selecting the term witchcraft, I have foreshortened Evans Pritchard's three-part title and the three distinct arguments that correspond to it. One, witchcraft accusations displace structurally inbuilt social tensions onto available victims. Two, oracles work within an idiom of thought that seems bizarre, but nonetheless has markedly logical and systematic features. And three, professional specialists in magic know how to obtain within their own logic, both true and tricked results. Potentially, at least, all are distillable into illuminating comparisons and might promote broader generalizations of what we know about scapegoating, of what we have been discovering about the social world of scientific work, and of the witting and more interesting, the unwitting, tricknology that has kept race science spicy and popular in America. Likewise, different and not necessarily parallel arguments could be developed from the definition of racecraft that I will presently offer. It is easy to think up more or less apt analogies between particular physical traits and their supposed effects. Nonetheless, those are traits that come to, be, come to the analysis ready-made, as it were, and with their clothes on. The interesting moments are those Durkham recounts when, in the midst of human doing, soul becomes visible, for example, as blood. Then, as he says, the soul itself can be seen from outside. Invisibility is part and parcel of whatever, whatever other traits we may notice. Neither witchcraft nor racecraft can exist without it. Therefore, how people cope with what facts or what, sorry, therefore how people cope with that fact links the difficulties of unmasking a witch with those that motivate the continuing search for a way to match up physical and non-physical race. The inhabitants of the West once experienced in their own sensible world an invisible ontology, rather like the one Apaya describes. According to Durkham, that realm was downgraded to the designation supernatural, 
only after modern science had created awareness that there is a natural order of things. In making the arguments he does about reason's additions to the real, thereby making possible a human real world, Durkham, the empirical scientist, devoted a long chapter of forms to the concept of soul, of all things. He sets out to reconstruct soul on the terrain of real things done, once shorn of confounding reference to the supernatural, invisibility turns out to have properties that can be explored empirically. I can go ahead if the following conceptions of, witch of witchcraft and racecraft pass muster, at least provisionally. First, witchcraft. Setting aside the various issues posed by different terms in different languages, the English word witchcraft can be defined this way. One among a complex system of beliefs, with combined moral and cognitive content that presuppose invisible, spiritual, i.e. non-material entities underlying and continually acting upon the visible material realm of beings and events. Now racecraft. One among a complex system of beliefs, also with combined moral and cognitive content that presuppose invisible spiritual qualities underlying and continually acting upon the material realm of beings and events. I assign the English suffix craft to both in the same right, for we need the component of socially ratified making or doing and its companion, the socially ratified belief that travels before and after it as input and as output. Marking the terms linguistically with craft announces that the workings of those phenomena are not open to objective or experimental demonstration, that is to say, by anyone, anywhere, and independent of doing or believing. We all can be more certain that witchcraft exists than, than that witches do. The same holds for racecraft and races. The Ubiquity and Miscellany of the Invisible that said, let us notice first the invisible realm of witchcraft. Therein spirits are ubiquitous and continually at work in the big events and small happenstances of everyday life. Moreover, they are at work miscellaneously. There is always room alongside their invisible mystical influences for what Westerners would call natural causes, as well as for explicit and true technical ideas about how things work. Their miscellaneousness means that judgments of which is which when do not flow neatly from rubrics and categories under which events can be subsumed in advance and without overlaps or remainders. In short, as the saying goes, circumstances alter cases. That miscellaneousness goes with invisibility is a crucial trait of spirit beliefs, and again with ubiquity. We are not in the presence of, now you see it, now you don't. You never see it, yet you can always see it. Real-world evidence is ever at hand. By its nature, though, such evidence is miscellaneous, not fixed or even fixable in any list of possible occurrences. That list is irre irremediably ad hoc. It stands ever open to addition as well as to change in the spiritual, logical, and even technological particulars of the items on it. Addition is one thing. Subtraction or upendings by incompatible evidence is quite another. The obviousness of the invisible. The existence of spirit is obvious in certain settings. Belief in them is uncontroversial and taken to be obviously true in Ashanti, Apaya tells us. In daily practice, they stand no more in need of rational defense than the planet's movements around the sun would in Europe. According to Apaya, however, that obviousness does not arise because people use examined or consistent ideas about what spirits are or how they work, but because, despite the invisibility of crucial operations, people regularly encounter their sensible outputs. As Apaya puts it, the evidence that spirits exist is obvious. Priests go into trance. People get better after the application of spiritual remedies. People die regularly from the action of inimical spirits. In short, confirming rituals seem regularly to be reconfirmed by nature itself. Thus, reason turns in a circle of its own making, towing the senses with it. Accordingly, in applying the term sensible to such evidence, I want to keep its two meanings in view, available to the senses and reasonable. 
evidence through doing. Furthermore, Apaya goes on, the reinterpretation of this evidence in terms of medical scientific theories or psychology requires that people have some reason to believe in them. But again and again, and especially in areas of mental and social life, the traditional view is likely to be confirmed. Besides, he says, after Evans Pritchard, this evidence is not only likely to be confirmed, but also, and just as important, it cannot easily be contradicted by experience. Spirit workings transcend experience, and the corresponding human practices presuppose a coherent system of mutually supporting beliefs. Witchcraft, Oracles, and Magic is, above all, a book about doing. If we follow Durkham, there is more to say. At the same time, that practices presuppose a system of belief, they, comp they confirm it as well. They make beliefs available to the senses through real-world doing. Confirming rituals can be ceremonious and occasional, or they can be deeds that fit into the profane comings and goings of everyday life. Combining both in early modern Europe, learned continental investigators used judicial torture in investigations of witchcraft, extracting confessions of invisible and sometimes impossible deeds. As St. Paul said of cheerier convictions, some things we believe by hearing and not by sight. Evidence through inference. Some of Evans, some of Evans Pritchard's examples bring out another sort of evidence in which folk biology and genetics make invisible deeds of witchcraft visible. Among the Azandi, witchcraft perpetrated by living people was discoverable through oracular trial, but since theory held witchcraft to be a physical substance located in the entrails of a witch or of his or her close male kin, the verdict could be checked by autopsy. As he did frequently throughout the book, Evans Pritchard stopped in the full midst of this strange thicket of invisible improbabilities with a reminder to his readers. Nonetheless, the Azandi were not so very different from Englishmen. The Zandi mind is logical and inquiring within the framework of its culture and insists on the coherence of its own idiom. Evidence was important to them and invisible deeds left biological signatures. Thus, if witchcraft is an organic substance, its presence can be ascertained by post-mortem search. If it is hereditary, it can be discovered in the belly of close male kinsmen, as in the witches. He drove his point home by citing a case of a convicted witch's vindication through autopsy of a juvenile nephew who died. The child's undistinguished innards retrieved the reputation of the man and his kin. Evidence as physical indices of non-physical things. Taking to the next level Evans Pritchard's emphasis on the rational incorporation of physical and genetic evidence, C.G. Seligman observed in his foreword that Evans Pritchard remained vague throughout about what the post-mortem evidence consisted of. Pres presumably, though, this lapse occurred because his informants were equally vague in what they could tell him. After all, anything found could not possibly be more than a visible index of still invisible deeds, since those autopsies did not spring from interests like those Western pathologists have when they open cadavers. The informants may have been uninterested in that sort of question, but courteously responsive to the curious outlander who kept asking. The important point, it seems to me, is not what that substance was or exactly where it might be found, but that Zandi theory postulated one. Invisible ontologies require, and therefore acquire, anchors in sensible experience, including quasi-biological anchors. By their nature, they must be propped up and helped along, one way or another. An innovation that made carriers of the substance readily recognizable at 50 yards would shift the problem of invisibility, but not necessarily solve it. Even so, visible physical difference is an unparalleled prop for invisible things. At first glance, the invisible aspect of racecraft is less immediately apparent than that of witchcraft. Race, it would seem, is eminently visible. But if it were, no one in America could possibly have understood Martha Luke, Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech. The invisible aspect of race becomes apparent, however, 
as soon as we reflect that the focus of racecraft is not the outward visible color of a person's skin, hair type, bone structure, etc., but the presumed inward invisible content of that person's character. It always it is always black and yellow, but white therefore, and so on, and is rarely a matter of appearance standing by itself. As a limiting case, take the example of Louis Agassiz, the Swiss naturalist and expert on fossil fish teeth who immigrated to America and to Harvard. His case has further interest because, as Stephen Jay Gould wrote in his masterly study of American race science, no man did more to establish and enhance the prestige of American biology during the 19th century. In 1846, having encountered black serving men at his Philadelphia hotel, Agassiz wrote to his mother, in seeing their black faces with their thick lips and grimacing teeth, their elongated hands, their large curved nails, and especially the livid color of their hands, I could not take my eyes off their face in order to tell them to stay far away. In motion, the hands took on hyperphysical significance, and when they advanced that hand in order to serve me, I wished I were able to depart in order to eat a piece of bread elsewhere, rather than dine with such service. Shocked by that first encounter, Agassiz began to doubt all our ideas about the confraternity of humankind and the single origin of our species, and presently converted to polygenesis, America's distinguished con distinguishing contribution to the biology of the day. Perhaps Agassiz calmed down when he became a distinguished visitor in wealthy Charleston milieu, where the owners of black servants made intimate domestic use of them. But even if he did not, it is important to notice that the slave owners operated with different perceptual conventions, and so the physical features of black slaves did not speak for themselves. Or, if they did, there was no easy predicting of what they might say. Like any other visible traits that might have been chosen, the visible conformations of the servant's hands served merely as an index for an invisible reality that was independent of them. Before long, Agassiz's, Agassiz's idiosyncratic physicality yielded to the more general mental habit of black and. By 1850, the empirical scientist was, like his new compatriots, riveted on invisible features. The indomitable, courageous, proud Indian, and how different a light he stands by the side of the submissive, obsequious, ob obsequious, imitative Negro, or by the side of the tricky, cunning, and cowardly Mongolian. For the Swiss biologists to make such a connection, evidence was needed, but given the nature of the invisible things to be evidenced, theoretical thought, underdetermined by observation, was needed as well, just as it was in the case of the Zandi pathologists, who linked invisible deeds with visible, visible particularities of the gut. In his demand for specifics about these particularities, Seligman was trapped in vulgar empiricism. There we must momentarily end the analogy with Zandi pathologists, however, because no ethnographer to 19th century race scientists would have found them uninterested in specific details of their evidence. Mountains of detail accompanied those researchers down a convoluted path starting from a physical here presumed to be systematically demonstrable and headed to a non-physical there, known in advance of demonstration. Even the here proved recalcitrant to systematization, since no trait or set of traits permitted the, the establishment of internally unified and mutually exclusive categories. Until today, the physical evidence has spoken like the storied villager who stops and starts in giving directions and finally gives up, saying, you can't get there from here. Visible and invisible props 
for invisible things. What is interesting about invisible ontologies is precisely that they are held up and helped along by props, without which they are unavailable to sense. But they are not the creatures of those props, and therefore not dependent on any particular one. The usable props are analogous to the oddments with which Levi Strauss defined bricolage in contrast to the specific purpose material of engineering. Once the existence of an invisible this or that is obvious, and everydayness makes rational defense irrelevant, evidence is everywhere at hand, available for miscellaneous ad hoc use. Thus, in a witchcraft cleansing episode, Bemba villagers, given the specific practical purposes at hand, ignored their exact knowledge of the difference between the skulls of chimpanzees and humans. The difference did not matter. Cleaning was cleaning. In racecraft, what matters fundamentally is not the physical particular, but what follows the end in black and, white and, yellow and. Racecraft can even do without the physical descriptor altogether, giving theoretical consistency full sway. Homer Plessy of the U.S. Supreme Court's Plessy v. Ferguson decision, which created the doctrine of separate but equal, appeared white until he announced his colored essence. The brief written by his white liberal counsel, Albion Turgi, stated that Plessy had one-eighth African blood with no discernible black features and was thus entitled to the legal privileges of a white man. It was Plessy's invisible traits that got him moved on his Louisiana train, in the same right as Agassiz's black, long-handed Negro would have been, and as Booker T. Washington actually was, that tan, gray-eyed son of a white man and a slave who quietly engineered Plessy's suit. Invisible ontologies require, and therefore acquire, visible props, but those props no more need be vulgarly empirical than do the substance extracted from Evans Pritchard's Zandi witches. Hence, the Nazis did indeed rely on their visual conception of Jews, but not so slavishly as to deny themselves help from badges and armbands. Let me open some parentheses. Durkham makes this point unforgettably in presenting an Australian world with human members of the kangaroo, cockatoo, lizard, and loose clans. The clansmen are born with a shared essence, of kangaroo, say, but with neither mutual resemblance to one another nor mutual difference from the members of other clans. Conventional emblems easily rectify both their inborn failure to resemble their respective totems and their even more consequential failure to resemble one another. With the observation that all human kangaroos can look alike only through social contrivance, that is, through craft, I close the parentheses. In racecraft, physical features function merely as a visible index of an invisible essence that is separate and different from them. Racial essences belong to racecraft's invisible ontology, even though the visible manifestations of those essences are usually available to most Americans from 50 yards or more as race. But they need not be, providing a vivid example of action by invisible entities in the sensible realm, the sociologist E. Franklin Fraser wrote about the house cleaning a southern woman undertook after discovering that the seemingly white patron of colored people she had just received in her parlor actually was not white, but colored. On what happened next, let me quote Fraser. She chopped up the chair in which he had sat and, after pouring gasoline over the pieces, made a bonfire of them. If the real world results were less tragic, the migration from one failed physical criterion to the next in 19th and 20th century race science would be just as comical as that lady's frenzied house cleaning. The empirical project of giving the pre-scientific races an empirical basis, invisible traits had failed by the 1930s. Even so, Harvard University into the 1960s had on its faculty a polygenesis or poly genist Carlton S. Kuhn, a fossil representative of the, by then, long-abandoned theory that the world's, he says five, races had evolved in separate lines and in different epochs. What often follows the 
end in racecraft clung to the discoveries Kuhn published in The Origins of Races, The Origin of Races, in which we read about the bulbous forehead, protruding eyes, and other infantile features characteristic of living Negroes. What is more, in America, those setbacks to scientific classification turn out not to, to have blocked allegedly scientific study of non-physical characteristics, such as propensity to violence, intelligence, morality, and even exotic matters that arise haphazardly in the comings and goings of life. Back in the 1980s, Tom Brokaw presided over a television program about racial differences in sport. His guest was an, was an Israeli researcher who devised a special machine set up near a hoop that measured jumps by black and white basketball players. The numbers he collected as evidence of racial differences in the jump revealed to him that black people are fast, muscle-twitch athletes. Apparently, none of the dramatist personae could recognize that if one started with people defined as black and white, they could not escape circular argument in arriving at their conclusions. A labor department sociologist I knew, a black woman, used to tell about the assignment she once got to investigate the disproportionate wintertime use of Vaseline by black prison inmates in comparison with their white peers. Since no one was prepared to credit her with having an answer from down home, saw research, she did the research and then told them. People used it to use it for chapped skin. Invisible Ontologies, Real Worlds. Now, if I have shown, at least provisionally, that the notion of invisible ontology applies equally well to witchcraft and racecraft, let me return to the logical conundrum. Those who know Apaya's remarkable book will notice that I have cribbed the phrase invisible ontology from the chapter Old Gods, New Worlds, where spirit beliefs are defended. Now, consider two similarly constructed statements. First, the truth is that there are no spirits. There is nothing in the world that can do all human beings ask spirits to do for them. Second, the truth is that there are no races. There is nothing in the world that can do all we ask race to do for us. A pious readers will notice that I cribbed again, taking the second statement word for word from the chapter Illusions of Race. If we hold both positions, defending the rationality of spirit beliefs, attacking the rationality of race beliefs, we arrive at this. Spirits do not exist, but belief in them is rational. Races do not exist, but belief in them is irrational. What distinction could be making, or sorry, what distinction could we be making, and what might warrant it? We may, we may well observe, as Apaya correctly does, that spirit beliefs are acquired in the course of African rearing, and furthermore, to quote him again, the evidence that spirits exist is obvious. Priests go into trance, people get better after the application of spiritual remedies. But we may equally well observe that race beliefs too are acquired in the course of rearing, and furthermore, that the evidence that race exists is obvious. Racial incidents are frequent, criminals and medical patients are counted by race, Statistical studies reveal racial differences in everything from death, from prostate cancer, to rates of decline in the incidence of teenage pregnancy. Since race is ubiquitous, that list is open to indefinite extension. One could add to it everything from blood pressure to consumer preferences, athletic prowess, propensity to welfare dependence, or to allegedly unfair claims to jobs likelihood to be transporting illegal drugs on the nation's streets and roads or lately through its airports and much else. In our race conscious world, virtually anything can be counted, will eventually be sorted, classified and published by someone according to racial differences, which as such lists demonstrate are everywhere and have inner mechanisms that it is assumed science will eventually vindicate. Apaya also proposes that, as a, as a vocabulary that organizes experience, Africa's invisible ontology organizes the world in one among many possible ways. It conceptualizes relations between spirits and persons as relations between persons. 
This is a powerful point that Evans Pritchard made about the Zandi idiom of thought. Such a conceptualization does indeed seem to preempt the space that impersonal causes occupy in Western science. And Apaya is quite right to say that there is little reason for medical, scientific, or psychological evidence to win out over traditional evidence, especially in the realms of mental and social life. What is more, as he points out, the spirit evidence suits those realms, not least because they are home territory for controlling and judging the doings of people, not of things. Zandi assumes that the world is in some kind of evaluative balance, in short, on the sort of assumption that leads monotheistic religions to develop theo theodicies. To progress in understanding the how of things that happen, scientific rationality had to get out of the business of accounting for good and bad fortune. In short, to abandon to religion teleological questions of why Africa's invisible ontology accommodates such questions. Let me offer as example a recent phone conversation I had about a geologist with a French doctorate who has spent several years unemployed in France. His wife was telling me that he had been bloqué. It transpired in conversation that she did not mean blocked by French-born competitors faced with an African-born black man who merely held French nationality, but instead by jealous kin in his home village. It would have been irrelevant and impertinent for me to rebut her assessment, or for that matter, even to ask questions about her logically and methodologically expanded conception of traditional notions about causing action at a distance. My friend was pointing to a truth about important relationships back home and the terms of human connectedness in a home community that are in reality determinative of her husband's life. They are his kin, Besides, as we both knew, 20 years earlier, those same jealous kin had engineered a disabling psychotic episode. Thereafter, until a reputable spiritual doctor intervened, they had effectively blocked his passing the French imported monster exam that stood between neo-colonials and bachelor's degrees. But just as we can say that Africa's ontology of spirits underpins personal modes of conceptualization, we can also say, comparably, that America's does similar work. That invisible ontology underpins a conceptualization of relations between persons as relations between races. And it too has provided a highly flexible yet deeply authoritative vocabulary in which to conceptualize good and evil, hence also, hence also the distribution of good and bad fortune. I have often been struck by the campus contrast between middle-class white students who arrive inertially, inertially at college from their suburbs and less well-off black students who, by finishing high school and going to college, represent a minority within a minority. The tough individualists belong to the latter group, but no amount of argument can shake the perception and conception of them from 50 yards as undeserving beneficiaries of handouts at best and at worst as dangerous people. A white student of mine suddenly remembered during a classroom discussion that as he sat studying in the library late one night the previous week, campus police had limited their car check to a table where a group of black students sat studying. That anti-individualism so strange in America connects the dots between doings as separate from one another as higher punishments for the same crimes and lower pay for the same skills. The pop statement of the theodicy problem, why do bad things happen to good people, has a pop answer of ancient pedigree. People to whom bad things happen cannot be all good. Max Weber stated long ago that, for most of human history, suffering indexed moral depravity and odiousness in the eyes of the gods and acquired a plus sign only as the ingenious invention of Judaism and then of Christianity. For the general rule is this, the fortunate man is seldom satisfied with the fact of being fortunate. Beyond this, he needs to know that he has a right to his good fortune. He wants to be convinced that he deserves it, and above all, that he deserves it in comparison with others. Good fortune thus wants to be legitimate fortune. Apaya's insight that invisible ontologies are especially well suited for imagining the world's evaluative balance is something to retain. 
Once again, however, the obviousness of such ontologies is an achievement of craft, never simply given. That is why my black colleague recently arrived from overseas, the late Sam Nolut Shangu, marveled at the attention given to the O.J. Simpson case. He dismissed it early on as a sordid domestic murder. It is also why, crossing in the hall after Simpson's acquittal, a usually courteous and garrulous white colleague in the same building passed me in silence, gaze averted, face an erectus of rage, white as a ghost. Although a black South African with profound knowledge of apartheid, Nalut Shangu seems nevertheless to have had a different apparatus for perceiving and conceiving race than we. That difference gave him the luxury of looking on like an ethnographer, with nothing personal at stake. As a black American, I carried around a deforming apparatus similar to my white American colleagues. For, N- for Nolot Shangu, by contrast, nothing inflated the import of the private tragedy or extended its scope. He had not acquired in childhood the conventional perceptions and effects that make this exception to American individualism powerful. Linguists study the acquisition of language, a fruitful line of fresh inquiry into both witchcraft and racecraft would involve watching how the acquisition of racecraft occurs in childhood, gradually overcoming the child's not yet socialized socialized capacity to see from within its horizon. Put in terms of spiritual realities, the to be socialized capacity to see takes something like the insider-outsider form of a collective representation, as proposed by Levi Bruhl. Not a being, not an object, not a natural phenomenon in their collective representation is what appears to us. Almost all we see in its in it escapes them or they are indifferent to it. On the other hand, they see in it many things which we do not even suspect. To young children, to young children from that standpoint, adults are surely a they. Let me offer <clears throat> Sorry, let me offer a commonplace instance that arose in conversation not long ago. A close friend told me of what she called a racial encounter in which her four-year-old daughter, Abby, walked up to a swearing, shouting, hyperventilating street altercation between two heavy-set women. Before a nearby security guard stepped between her and them, the little girl had walked up close and sternly warned them, as her nursery school teacher does, you are not practicing peaceful community. <laughs> That's cute. In America, this story does not have its full meaning without the colors, so let me supply them. The white child, her white mother, the black woman, the black guard. Abby didn't see colors, her mother told me. But this is America. The grown-ups did see colors, and Abby soon will. Some version of America's race belief eventually will seem no more worth querying to Abigail than the existence of spirits does to children in a pious Ashanti. Let me note once again, however, that, once acquired, this seeing serves miscellaneously. To say that it plays a role in the social discernment of good and evil, and of good and bad fortune, is one thing. To think of it as causing particular events or judgments, and then hitch it simplistically to them, would be another, and would be wrong. It provides not a detailed constitution equipped with authoritative and self-activating rules for every possible case, but simply a kind of raw material. Once acquired, that seeing becomes open-endedly applicable to specific contingencies of life as they come up, or at least until the theorizing impulse hardens them into fixed forms. Thus, the victim of the lynching in D.W. Griffith, Griffith's 1915 American classic, Birth of a Nation, became black by being lynched. He was not lynched because already black. Again, that film's half-black, half-white reconstruction politi- politician became half black and not half white through the same process, but need not have done elsewhere or under different circumstances. Meanwhile, in the real world depicted by the film, those two kinds of drama were at the hot core of new politics destined to shape public discourse about who gets what and why. The late C. Van Woodward's great biography, Tom Watson, recounts the life of a man who began as a populist advocate of poor farmers' interests, black and white, but evolved into a virulent and violent racist. I think of witchcraft in a similar way. It is adaptable to all kinds of contingencies. 
so long as it moves in step with the human doing and thinking that together confirm its reality. In other words, by keeping it invisible underpinnings sensible. Sorry, by keeping its invisible underpinnings sensible. If either were only a museum specimen of human reason to be gazed upon more or less elegantly, it would not matter whether our intellectual machinery enabled us to grasp them adequately. But getting that right matters, for both are active in the world. They are active not only as resources for making sense of evil, but also as sources of evil in their own right. To gain the edge for Jesse Helms in his closely contested last Senate race, all it took was for the Senator's TV ad men to show a white hand receiving a pink slip and a black one receiving a pay stub. Analogously, the health crisis that has followed Africa's economic crisis has allowed anti-witchcraft practitioners to gain fresh prominence and in some cases to do terrible harm. Propagating the scientific truth of human likeness until doomsday, as President Clinton did in his 1998 State of the Union speech, cannot undo the power of racecraft any more than propagation of the truth that there are no witches has undone the power of witchcraft. Perhaps some other method can, if we set out to study the sort of rationality they share, purposely and with a sense of something important at stake. The Half Dark of Evans Pritchard's Legacy, An Ethical Dilemma I am one of those who have resisted an ethnocentric, if not directly racist, the conclusion Sorry, I am one of those who have resisted as ethnocentric, if not directly racist, the conclusion that spirit beliefs bespeak African peculiarities or deficiencies of rational thought, even when those beliefs are put into hideous action in the killing of witches. I therefore used Evans Pritchard's methods in my demonstration that seemingly irrational spirit beliefs powered rational strategies against British colonial rule even though in one such episode, the Moana Lessa episode of 1925, many Africans accused of witchcraft lost their lives. But I myself am subject to the logic I have criticized insofar as I resist the conclusion that if those beliefs pass the test of rationality, so should America's race beliefs. Those beliefs too are sometimes put into hideous action. Therefore, once again, unless so different that I err in treating them as comparable, both sets of traditional beliefs should be regarded in the same way, as extremely resilient falsities that lead to moral error and human suffering, or as extremely complicated truths that reflect the capacity of reason, our most human holding, to uplift and degrade our humanity as it will. We do not treat both sets of traditional beliefs as comparable, I think, because we, myself included, tend not to juxtapose the conclusions we reach in those different realms. We experience some version of the intellectual compartmentalization that, according to Evans Pritchard, protected Zandi beliefs in general, and that specifically protected certain foundational intellectual investments attached to them. The axiomatic inviolability of their king's oracle, for instance. As inheritors of the Enlightenment, we have foundational intellectual investments not in traditional authority, but in rationality. We turn to rationality in both cognitive and moral reflection, in rough and ready fashion. Therefore, we require a certain consistency between them. But even, but even if the comings and goings of life or of thought do not yield that consistency, we do not feel obligated to abandon that investment. In this way, I think Western scholars learned, professionally at least, to suspend moral judgment on spirit beliefs in witchcraft, even in their bloody manifestations, by learning to grasp their rationality, all the while believing the beliefs to be false. But because we expect consistency, the consequence of treating racecraft as rational, or even reasonable, would be to blunt the intellectual tools with which we most readily con condemn it as immoral. It is false, and once one has seen evidence of its falsity, continuing to act on the basis of it moves one from a cognitive problem to a moral one. The same strategies that allow us to deny the rationality of racecraft should allow us to deny that of witchcraft and condemn it accordingly. Instead, they give us racecraft as objectively false and witchcraft as true in its own fashion. 
but not witchcraft as objectively false and racecraft as true in its own fashion. The short circuit in Evans Pritchard's machinery. The problem is not only the moral and ethical dilemmas we confront as a result. There is also a short circuit in our intellectual machinery that lessens its power. If racecraft is unlike witchcraft, then lifting from us what Apaya calls its burdensome legacy becomes easy lifting. All that is needed is propagation of the truth. Repetition of the scientific statement, there are no races, will suffice. But if racecraft is like witchcraft, then repetition can do no more than transmute the scientific statement into the ritual drone of a mantra. By the time we get to the end of Evans Pritchard's monumental work, the original wiring that connected racecraft with his problem has been cut, and therewith his own access to a far closer cognate than Western science. For his comparison, he connected Zandi modes of thought not with English modes of thought that have similar properties, but with scientific modes. As a result, we no longer have a climactically intense problem of how disconfirming evidence breaks across ships of false belief without sinking them, indeed in wave after seen but unnoticed waved. Making the strange sim making the strange familiar. To examine more closely how Evans Pritchard moved intellectually beyond the obvious to the ethnographer, falsity of witchcraft, let me return once again to his masterpiece. It is appropriate to remind ourselves that Evans Pritchard set out to apply in the field notions about the sociology of knowledge, as suggested by Durkheim in the elementary forms of religious life, and differently by Lucien Levi Bruhl in Les Fonctions Mentales dans les Sociétés Inférieures. From his standpoint in the 20th century, from his standpoint in the 20th century West, Evans Pritchard posed a fundamental question about witchcraft, which can be paraphrased in this way. How can one account for its appearing to a normally constituted rational person as something whose reality cannot readily be doubted? His answer used the strategy of remote imagining that ethnographers sometimes call making the strange familiar. His mistake was to apply that strategy while assuming implicitly that his own world, secular and scientific, possessed nothing like it. He correctly argued that, if properly situated in their socially determined intellectual context, witchcraft beliefs would make sense not only to his ethno ethnographic subjects, but also to anyone who took up intellectual residence there, including himself. They constituted a coherent idiom of thought with particular traits. For example, Zandi were not satisfied with knowing that a person died from the physical results of a poisonous snake bite, but required to know why why the snake slithered where the victim passed, how the victim happened to take unfortunate path, and so on. What struck the Izandi as a culturally satisfying answer was couched in terms of personal agency, not simply of impersonal qualities of poisons acting on a human body. In other words, start from the Zandi assumptions about the correct question to ask and the nature of a correct answer. Assume the existence of spirits and their activation through witchcraft and voila, even a native from Oxbridge like Evans Pritchard can appreciate why spirits could appear to a normally constituted person as something whose reality cannot readily be doubted, doubted, while not making the familiar strange. Though the gains are clear and have led to much fruitful research, nonetheless it seems to me that an ethical problem has traveled with those gains as a barnacle does with a ship. Since Evans Pritchard's own doubt and his readers remains as strong at the end of witchcraft oracles and magic as it is as at its beginning that very doubt set up a fundamental inequality an elitism, an elitism of getting it right raises the ethnographer and his readers above the azandi who for the reasons carefully laid out could not help getting it wrong the truth remained that there are no spirits and that there is nothing in the world that can do what the azandi expected spirits to do so the problem became one of working out how those false beliefs come into being and how they could be part of what held a community together, cognitively and morally. To complete their analysis, or to complete that analysis, he needed something that was as hard for a European to doubt as the existence of spirits was for a Zandi. Without it, we get the elitism of doubt just referred to, doubt easily come by, 
for Evans Pritchard and for his European readers, but not for the Azandi. Evans Pritchard was keen enough to open the question of indigenous doubt, which he answered with several notions. One such notion was the secondary elaboration of belief, a rubric for various ways in which failures of doing and inconsistencies of thought come to be shrouded from view. Another notion is idiom of thought, thus spirit beliefs or the very texture of a Zandi's thought, and he cannot think that his thought is wrong. As I said earlier then, we displace but do not get rid of particularized notions about African thinking. For the original problem to be kept a general one about humanity and about human thinking, Evans Pritchard's strategy of making the strange familiar was not enough. The capacity for doubt of Evans Pritchard, the ethnographer, was an inte intellectual holding a tad too easily come by because it rested merely on outsiderhood. Anyone can identify what seems odd or false in the mental habits of an alien somewhere. But if something is the very texture of an insider's thought anywhere, it is the work of genius, not of ordinary men and women, to think that one's thought is wrong. That is why I suggest that it is important to complement and establish checks within Evans Pritchard's strategy of making the strange familiar with the opposite one of making the familiar strange. It seems to me that, right through the 20th century, American race beliefs continue to offer us an invisible ontology whose reality cannot readily be doubted by normally constituted rational American men and women. It provides an idiom of thought, is protected by secondary elaboration of belief, is acquired as obvious and uncontroversial, and so forth. Setting that invisible ontology alongside other people's is one way of keeping ourselves honest and modest. If we say the truth is there are no races, and in any way blink, then racecraft can provide a useful complement to Evans Pritchard's strategy of remote imagining. When 20th century Africans went on making their visible world of beings and events collectively comprehensible by underpinning it with an invisible ontology, they did not exhibit a problem that humans anywhere can avoid and remain fully human. In America, it is neither here nor there to affirm the truth that there are no races. Like witchcraft in its African contexts, racecraft points to truth about important relationships here and to terms of human connectedness in our home community that are in reality determinative of all our lives. In those circumstances, talk of color blindness resonates either as the visionary message of kings I have a dream speech or as a king of peekaboo or as a kind of peekaboo dishonesty on the part of self-interested racecraft. In like fashion, African villagers suspected that their self-appointed civilizers were dishonest, self-interested autocrats from afar, or at best, well-intentioned but naive deniers of reality. We can think of King's dream as his own kind of civilizing mission in his own land, the natives of which have a choice to make. That choice is every bit as haunting as the one Apaya sets forth at the end of Old God's New Worlds. If modernization is conceived of, in part as the acceptance of science, we have to decide whether the evidence obliges us to give up the invisible ontology. America is modern, has accepted science, and has yet to decide whether the evidence obliges us to give up the invisible ontology. I have tried to suggest that Apaya refers to a predicament that is not restricted to African contexts, but shared by all human beings. That being the case, our studies on witchcraft require general formulations that can apply beyond our immediate geographical sphere of work. My contention that examining witch witchcraft and racecraft together can illuminate both is one means to that end. My extending, and I hope not distorting, Apaya's notion of invisible ontology is another, so long as we can keep our footing along its slippery limits. I have shown that in our different approaches to spirits and races, we have been traveling those slippery limits logically and ethically.